Um, hello, Alison. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Well, Alison, um, you've been on boards since your early 20s. Um, so a good few years of experience there. And um, we just want to learn from your wisdom today. So first of all, can we start off with what has been your sort of board journey to date? Well, I suppose it goes back to when I left university and I um, worked for a citizens advice bureau and they were looking for a sort of staff person to be on there, what was then called a management committee. We didn't used to call them boards in the charity sector, really. Um, and I got involved in that. I really liked it. I've liked seeing how the organisation worked mm. um, and so over the next I suppose 10 years I did some sort of charity board stuff um, and I think that the thing that tracked through all of it is and a really good lesson for people is I've always got involved with things I'm really interested in yeah um, so I spent a long time as a school governor on I think I was on four different governing bodies um, over a period of probably about 15 years. Um, my son was at school at the time. So that was, you know, and I was interested in education, but, um, and I did chair it for, for a while, his junior school governing board. Um, but actually the best experience I had in, on a school was when I chaired a, what was called a fresh start school for 10 years and that had nothing to do with me or my family and I found that um I found that personally more liberating and whatever without having a you know a child at that school um yeah. although you know you absolutely do need service users of you know on, yeah. you know on boards as well so it's just what suit what what suits you I learned that I was better if I could be slightly more objective yeah um what else have I done? So I was a magistrate for about 15 years and got involved in the sort of governance of, of that, um, other charity boards, and then lots and lots of stuff in the housing sector, which is where I've ended up and what I really love. Yeah. And so um, about 15 years, you said, now in the housing yeah. sector. Amazing. So it sort of went back to where I started when I, I used to work for local authority, um, yeah. you know, in the in the 1980s and 90s. So it was sort of a bit of that sort of going home stuff. But I'm now um, I'm on the board of a couple of housing associations, um, a, a, a very small charity um, that provides housing for older people, which is where my mum lived and died. Um, and that's a sort of personal thing. Yeah. Um, and then a couple of sort of sector-wide bodies. So one's um, Housing Diversity Network and um, something called the TPAS, which is an engagement organisation in the housing sector. And I think the Housing Diversity Network is sort of how we bumped into each other through lovely Bethan at the National Housing Federation, didn't we? Yeah, she's brilliant. She's really opened doors for us. It's been fantastic. She's ace, just yeah. ace. And, um, then, and Alison and I had a chat a little while ago and spoke about all things to do with mix on housing boards. And I think it really highlighted to me, Alison, that whilst you know, the conversation needs to be holistic um, and sometimes that's missing. Um, so I guess I wondered, what have you seen that's kind of lacking from the conversation about mix on boards or what things have frustrated you? Because it's helpful to hear insights from those that have been in the sector for a long time as well. So one of the things I've wrangled with, I suppose, over the years is, um, so I set my stall out, I believe in experts. We need experts. I'm not Michael Grove. So any number of reasons. So I do believe in, in the power of experts, but a good board is better than a series of technical experts in something. Mm. Um, and I think particularly within housing associations with the sector change with the introduction of private finance, um, you know, lots and lots and lots of treasury management, um, risk obviously at different level, um, Boards that had traditionally had a lot of tenants on, for instance, um, suddenly morphed into boards that were far more, um, you know, full of independence, um, trying to make, you know, for, for good reason, you know, suddenly if you're trying to manage a, a, you know, treasury portfolio of, you know, hundreds of millions of pounds, you actually need to make sure that you've got the right people. Um, 
but I think it's not just about that. Mm. Um, and I don't think it's beyond the wit of really good um, boards to to make sure that more voices are heard than just the technical voices. Yeah. Um, I used to say, you know, at this rate, that the rate we're going, diversity on boards will mean, you know, nine accountants, you know, with nine different protected characteristics. You know, that is not diversity. Yeah. So we need, you know, if we truly, um, you know, all the all the research, you know, you know, you know it all, all out there to say more diverse boards are more profitable. Uh, make better decisions and are safer places mm -hmm. um, and they they can look after the organ keep the organization safe far more effectively um, so we need people who are able to question um, mm -hmm. now how you do that is really important um, but we need to understand everything it is that the organization does so you know there's nobody out there who's not heard of Grenfell the stuff that's going on at the um, you know, at the inquiry is both heartbreaking and bewildering. And if you're not fired up with anger, at, you know, it's, you know, somebody, I think Dominic Lawson said in the Sunday Times recently, probably the biggest corporate scandal that we've, you know, we've seen for, for decades in this country. And since then, you know, one of the questions I've asked is if I was on that board, what could I have done? What could I have asked? Because you know the, the power. You know what all we have as, as board members is that ability to ask questions. You know there isn't really very much that we have in that. You know, yeah. Our work on the whole is done in those. Um, you know, I used to say sitting around that table. Now it's staring into a into a screen, which maybe we can come back to because that makes that makes it more difficult. I think. Yeah. So what are the questions I could ask? Um, and. You know the three main functions of a board along with everything else obviously are, you know set the strategy of the organization manage risk for the organization and make sure that you've got assurance around everything that the organization does so what was missing from Grenfell there you know what didn't we know what didn't that board know how could it have known um and part of what is coming out of the inquiry and what was there beforehand was that the resident, the people who lived in Grenfell did not feel heard or listened to. And in fact, you know, some of the stuff coming out of the inquiry has got people down as difficult, vexatious, whatever. So how clear are we if we are, you know, responsible for an organisation with front facing services? Yeah. Um, yes, we do need your tre treasury expert. Yes, you do need your accountant. Yes, you do need you know, all these other people with technical expertise. You also need people who understand what it is like to live in those properties, what it's like to live in those communities, um, not to represent the views in a old fashioned kind of a way, but who just brings something else yeah. to the table. Um, and you need a truly diverse board to be able to do that. Yeah, it's, it is really complicated and it's made me realize how bigger role being a chair of the board is because ultimately it falls to the chair to work that out um, and it's and I guess as you're saying it one of the things that comes to mind that we've been saying a lot is it's an art not a science absolutely you can't like you can't be like cool well all the boards just need this checklist and yeah. then it'll all be great yeah because so, here, so here's your skill here's your skills we've all got a skills matrix tick 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 um you know, but it's about culture on the board. It's about behaviours I've sat on, but you know, in boards where, you know, invariably someone's left the room crying at the end of the day. That's not a good board to be on. I've been on a board where you've got the biggest brains in a sector, and if they don't, people don't open the mouth, mm -hmm. then they're not, you know, yeah. not doing not doing the job. I think the rise of the SID is really interesting, and we're finding we're getting that senior independent director into the into housing association boards now at quite a pace and I think that's really important because uh, I've just before I came here I had a catch up with the SID on one of the boards I'm on and just it was just great it was the it's a sort of how's it going for you question because that's really important and if you've got someone who isn't the chair 
that you can have that conversation with. It's, you know, not easy. You don't want them to, to go away and do something about it, but just to give you the opportunity to say, you know, when it's the art bit, how you feel is really important. That just the way we reached that decision just didn't feel right. Or actually, that's that was great because everyone was heard, everyone acknowledged everyone else's position, yeah. everyone acknowledged the technical data that came into that. Yeah. Every, and we ended up with a good boards add to the sum of things. You're not just there to sit there and go, thanks for that paper, cheers, and I'll have my check. Thank you very much. That's mm -hmm. You know, that's not satisfactory for, for, for anyone. I think people on boards want to add to the sum of things. Yeah. And it's um, funny, whenever you join a board, you don't, I don't think you ever fully know how you will be adding to the sum of it until you kind of get going. And then you're like, oh, I didn't realise I was going to be speaking into communications or marketing or an area that's not in your prior experience, but actually you add a lot of value there. I always reckon a good board would make a really good quiz team. Like you know, because you do, I once was on a charity board for a victim support and it had a couple of um, ex, ex police officers on it. And honestly, they're brilliant because they know everything about every, all sorts of bizarre things. But just that, are you reflecting, do you boards all like the same thing? Do you all have the same hobbies? Do you all go yes. to the same place? In which case, if that's the case, then it's probably not a very diverse board. Yeah. You know, and it's certainly, you know, and it used to be the case, particularly in the charity church sector, that you would, um, people would, people like spending time with people they like. Yeah. We do, don't we? That's what, and, and a board is never about your best friend, you know, getting your best mates together. It's got to be about mm -hmm. getting the right mix of skills, experience, you know, questioning. I, at, a, at a, a board meeting a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a paper on something and I, I just said, I don't understand this. I don't know what this is about. And you have to put yourself in a position of weakness to do yeah. that. Yeah. You're saying, look, I am not, you know, I don't understand that. And, and I was getting messages from people going, oh, I didn't understand it either. And you think, oh, if your board doesn't understand it, then something isn't right. Yeah. And you have to have people that are confident enough to ask those questions as well. Yeah, and it also it should, you know, it essentially as a human, it's you know, good boards are very human. Yeah. Um, and it can be fun. You know, it's not all sitting there being really serious. Um, you know, you can have a good time. You get to hear the best of an organisation. You get to see the, you know, what's and all. Um, yeah. But I think you always remember, you know, in the housing sector, if you're on a housing sector board, if something goes catastrophically wrong, it doesn't matter what it is, it is always a failure of governance. So, yeah. um, and I always say that you know, I don't, I don't want to be operational, but if there's an operational issue that's causing a risk to the business, the board needs to really understand it, have a deep dive, have a look, and then promise to get out of the way. Yeah. as soon as you've got some assurance that everything's yeah I was going to say it comes back to your assurance point doesn't it how do you know and that's one of the things that um I remember the, the fresh start school I was involved in many many years ago we we had HMI visit um every term for for three years so that that was a really good grounding to go up against a seat you know the person who's now head of inspection at Ofsted I mean goodness he knew his stuff and the question he asked me more often than not was, how do you know? And if I, if the, my answer to how do you know was always, well, the head teacher told me that, you know, you've got so many other things that add to your how do you know? Yeah. Um, not everyone on your board will be, you know, your account set of accounts will tell you one story, but you, what your internal auditor is telling you will tell you something else. Feedback from your customers will tell you something else. Mm. So if, you if you've got a staff turnover of 25%, that's telling you something. And it's it's like doing a jigsaw, it's putting them all together and it's that triangulation thing is, you know, is everyone telling me the same thing? That's fine, I don't need to yeah. worry about it. And it's kind of having an inquisitive mind as well. That you kind of need to be curious about those things. Oh, absolutely, curiosity is, a, is I don't know whether it is a real um, gift and I think it will help us, you know, solve some intractable problems in the future if we encourage um, that curiosity. And I think the more we are um, 
you know, staring down a screen. There's a risk of us not doing that enough because I think those can enjoy the pandemic. There was a load of stuff we had to get done. Mm. You know, we just had to make sure that we could operate this service, keep people safe without going in the office. That was, you know, if we'd sat down with a project plan, that would have been a two year project to do what people did in a week, uh, which actually there's a different lesson in there, isn't there, about, mm. you know, planning. But, um, so we, we, we need to get all our ducks in a row. And we, we did that really quickly, I think, online. Yeah. I think it's harder when you're talking about strategy, when you're talking about culture, when you're just having those, oh, what if? conversations I think that's an awful lot harder um so hopefully we'll I think we'll keep some of this stuff online mm -hmm. but hopefully not all of it yeah and we'll really think about what adds value when you're together as well yeah like actually how can you get close to the tenant voice yeah um there's you know we've we've got lots to grapple with in the housing sector we've got building safety stuff coming along We've got a new social housing white paper, um, a charter for residents, and a big part of that is how do boards hear the voice of voice of their residents. So um, there's going to be active regulation of that. Um, so we need people who understand communities to join housing association boards. It doesn't need to be people, you know, it can be people who are tenants or leaseholders or have been or know who pe people who are, who are just working in our, you know, yeah. highly urban areas um but once you get here it's a bit addictive so if you're interested do take a look yeah and Alison, i was going to ask you that what is your main message for anyone that's considering joining a housing association board well, considering, so down, wait i'll change that considering applying to join a housing association board so it is more difficult than it used to be i think um because housing associations tend to pay their board members um, I, I once saw something uh, on the Institute of Directors website which really irritated me saying if you're looking for a non-exec career you can do worse than cut your teeth in the housing association sector which is frankly so disrespectful and yeah. you know whatever um, so once you pay you attract more people and that squeezes out you know this is where diversity it's where class comes into it it's where you know education comes into it people who are expert you know and our adverts tend to say oh looking for someone with senior executive experience of and you think well you've got those on your exec team do you really need that is that really the most are you saying that you haven't got those skills indoors so you need to put it in your board so think really really carefully about that there's a difference between having experience of Mm -hmm. and understanding and being able to ask questions around um, so for most people you probably need some other experience before you apply to join a housing association board not 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 in all cases um so my my top tip the thing that's you know given me the most joy i suppose is find something you're really interested in yeah and if you can help somebody in that sector so that might be sports you know, it might be a school, it might be your local Sydney's Advice Bureau. There are so many organisations who really, really need people with the time and the commitment to help them get their governance right. And I think once you've got that, mm. you know, have a look at the housing sector because there's some fabulous people doing some great work. Yeah. And it's so, such an interesting one for representation and how you, it's so clear. It's much more complicated than lots of other sectors. But in housing association, it's so clear who you're there to represent. Yeah. And yeah. Who's, who's in the end the stakeholder that really matters is your tenants and yeah. making sure their voice is heard and their needs are met. Um, and I've got a, a great friend who, um, you know, sent me something the other day, and it's a, I, I don't know where this saying came from, but it says it's um, says something. If she can see it, she can do it. Um, and people need to see themselves represented yeah in boards because if all you see is a load of you know people whose experience is nothing like yours you feel like you've got absolutely nothing in common with them and however brilliant you are it's another hurdle yeah you know, to think that's not for the likes of me um so we just need to you know crack on um there are some fantastic people out there and we 
you know, we just need to be really, really, really um, tough on ourselves, you know, to really question ourselves. If every time we've got recommendations for appointment and we need three people and the three men, three white men, you know, it's, that's not, you know, that's not dissing, that's not being, you know, anti anybody, but are we sure? Absolutely sure. Are we looking in the right places? The words we kept using is mix. Yeah. Because I think the word diversity has got really loaded. And people think it means it has to be women or it, it's all about ethnic minorities. And it's actually more than that. Like, yes to both of those, but we need a mix. Ultimately, yeah. you need a gender mix. You need a mixture of ethnicities on your board. You need a mixture yeah. of classes and backgrounds. You need a mixture yeah. of accents when you start looking across the UK. And that's really exciting when you start thinking about imagining that happening and the difference that's going to make to government. Yeah. Oh, one of the boards I'm on, we managed to get a new board member a couple of years ago who's a young um, young man. So he's in his 20s um, and he's a wheelchair user, works in inclusion. Um, but just the questions he asks are absolutely, you know, what, you know nobody sitting around that table you yeah. know, is asking the same, same questions that, that he is. Um, and, you know, we are just so lucky to have him. And, yeah. the, you know, we're talking a lot about, you know, technology, we talk about, you know, cyber risk, we talk about all sorts of things. You do not want a bunch of people sitting around the table who still think that if they press the wrong button, they'll break the internet. <laughs> you don't want that. Yeah, so you're an advocate for multi-generational boards, Alison. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. As long as we don't all have to go, you know, doing whitewater rafting or something to bond then I think I'm all up for that. <laughs> That's brilliant. I think um, it's funny because I kind of really want the message to be multi-generational boards rather than out with the old and with the young. Um, yeah. we, we do want more younger people on boards but in the, the goal where we're headed to is to have multi-generational boards yeah. because the wealth of knowledge that people like yourself told Alison when you've had a good amount of years of experience on boards in social good sectors, then, you know, it'd be such a loss for a board not to have your kind of experience on it. But like you said, the young guy that came along brought something totally different. Yeah, and yeah, you know, we have in, in um, the housing sector, we've got something called um, CIH Futures, which is a group of young housing professionals. And just the way they work is astonishing. They just work differently. Their brains are, you know, are different, but, you know, we can learn from each other. And that's absolutely great. Um, you know, and our tenants, you know, oldest tenant, you know, one place I went, where I was the chair, 105. Wow. Providing a service for people aged not to 105. So actually just having people in the 40s, for instance, isn't much help. We need to, you know, we need that, that spread of things. And it makes it more, you know, one of the things... I feel really privileged about that is the amount of stuff I've learned from people I've sat on boards with and the, the amount of people I've, who, who I might have gone, oh, I have nothing in common with them, but actually, you know, are just doing amazing work. Yeah. And, you know, have taught me stuff and hopefully they've learned stuff from me as well. And that's great, honestly. The world's in a mess because, you know, we're all stuck in, you're either this or you're that, you're for this, you're against that, you know, blah, blah, blah. Let's stop doing that. Yeah, we've all got something to learn from other people. Thank you, Alison. That's so encouraging. And we need to hear those messages of hope and positivity at the end of this year. Thank you, Alison. Happy Christmas. Love to see your Christmas tree and angel in the background. <laughs> um, have a good one. And thank you for giving us cause for hope. Thank you. And good work with every good luck with everything you're doing. Thanks. Okay. Bye.